But this psalm is perfect because don't remember the sins of my youth nor of my ignorance. So either because you're young and dumb, involved in those things, or because you didn't know, involved in those things. But remember me according to your mercy because of your loving kindness, O Lord. So we look back and say, oh, please forget those things that, that, I, that I did. And I look at those things now and say, okay, I learned from them, perhaps I suffered because of them, and now as I've gotten older and aged, I can see what really matters and what, what to focus on, and please God forgive me for those things that, that have passed, those things that, that I've done. And so that's a big part, I think, also of, of aging, is really looking and repenting, looking back and saying, okay, here are the things that I really need to repent of. And that's the beautiful thing about confession. You know, in the Orthodox Church, when we confess our sins, uh, the Lord... When we sincerely repent from them, confess our sins, are sincerely sorry, and turn away from them, those sins are forgotten and forgiven, and they are gone. And so he does not remember the sins of our youth, but we need to make sure that we repent of them, and bring them out into the open, and bring them out so that we can, can recognize uh, what kind of hold they might have had on, on us. And as Arthur uh, mentioned, that aging is a letting go. And it's even letting go of some of those sins. Letting go of some of those things that we've been holding in uh, because we're afraid of something. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for me, uh, getting old uh, has helped me to review my life so that I can now recognize the sins of my youth and the sense of my middle years that I never did at that time. Right. And uh, the Catholic Church encourages a general confession. So with uh, a little bit of um, meditation on your past, and I need a piece of paper. <laughs> they are numerous. Uh, we make a general confession with sincere uh, contrition. And by general confession, you mean and I'll bring your all, all your past years, which is uh, comforting, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's never too late to bring something up. You know, and you, you just understand things differently. Absolutely. That I didn't understand at the time, but I understand them now. Right. Not realize that something that you, that you did feeling like you were right in doing it was perhaps in mm -hmm. as you look back on it. And that, that's a very, that's a difficult thing of sometimes because that means admitting wrong in a situation where we thought we were the ones that were right. Um, but that, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And that, that is definitely something that uh, would be okay for any of us to do is to look back into our lives and really take stock of what we have, what we've done um, to be able to move forward from that and to forgive the sins of youth. And I think, Miss Virginia, you're a member of those of ignorance. Do not remember the sins of my youth nor my ignorance that you just mentioned. You also said something about um, it's a different point of view, a, a different. That's right. And so many things just. Um, I will think of some episode in my life and, and realize now what the significance of that was, what it meant, and it's just totally different from what I thought at the time. It's not so much, you know, we, we can't think about anything except in context. And when you have a lot more context, that changes the way you see everything, the way you think of everything. Very much true. Very much true. So for us to be discerning as we age. I think too that as you get older, I mean, I, I would think that 
part of what you see as you're looking back is you see your sins, but you see maybe the self-love even in the good things that you did. Like, I think that, of course, you're, you have to go meet your maker and you're going to be judged, but I think there's also the question of, did I do everything for God? Like, was it, were all the things that I did really for God? Um, and I, don't know, I think as you get older, you see, hopefully you see that more clearly. What your motivations What your motivations your were. Because we can all do good things, but often it, we do them because they meet our idea of what we would like to be. Or we have an idea of ourselves maybe as being a good person or a holy person. But I think as you get older, you can see your intentions more clearly. Because um, you know yourself more. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, don't, I think we talked last week about the good thief, mm -hmm. and um, I've been thinking about him a lot this week, and I think he's just, he's amazing that, I guess there's always hope that you can do something, you can still give a witness, you can still sort of purely, I mean he had so much faith. I mean, he really had faith and he really loved God in that moment, even though maybe his whole life before then was was a waste. Just even at the last moment, you can still give God an act of, of love. Right, yeah. and even say that that wasn't a waste, that was what he needed to get to that moment where he was on the cross next to Christ so that he could have that, that moment. Mm -hmm. And can see, oh, I passed through all that suffering and stupidity, even though I was ignorant and dumb, I'm still able to be saved. And that, I, that's a great hope. That's a, that's a great hope. Okay. And part of that then, and that's a great segue anyway, to aging being a witness. It's a witness. Because everything that we do is watched. You know, if, if you have children, you know your children are watching everything that you do. And so aging helps help us to show Young people, and this is a picture of uh, some of our young campers, they're watching how we live, how we mourn when loss comes to us, how we cope when sufferings happen uh, to us when we, as we are aging, as we are going through all of these pains and difficulties. Aging then is a witness. It's a witness to the, the young people about this is where you will be and this is how you can handle it. And so it's a, it can be a continuous witness uh, to the church. You're, you're smart. Yeah, kids learn a lot through watching. Absolutely. When I cry, Loretta starts cleaning the house. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just in day to day coping. I'm sure she'll be watching when I really mourn. Yep. She'll watch, learn, and hear some of, some of your actions. So I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So this is St. Paul writing to Timothy, and Timothy is a younger person who he is uh, appointed to be an elder in that church and he even tells him you know let no one despise your youth he you tells that to Timothy and so he is trying to tell Timothy about how okay I'm done I have finished the race I have fought the good fight and so the young are watching the old to do the work that needs to be done to do the things the good that needs to be done as, as Miss Virginia was just saying you do the good that needs to be done and you know, sometimes I bet when you were doing those things with resentment, someone might have seen it and learned that you do the good. And, and so that's, you know, even, even if our intentions aren't always the best, people are watching us. And so we, sometimes we just force ourselves to do it because we know that people are, wa that young ones are watching and we need to do this. This is the good that does need to be done. And then eventually, Lord willing, the resentments go and we just do it because we love to do it and we love the people that we're doing it for. And that's something I guess that comes along with, with aging. It's a, it's a blessing that, that way, to be a witness and a guide for the, the next generation. We're never, 
never just doing it for us. We always have to think about the entire body. That's one great thing about being part of the church. The church is the body of Christ. And so when one suffers, all suffer, as St. Paul talks about. And so when we are the church, we show how to make up for that, that part of the body that's suffering. And so we teach the young people to do that. And I, I used to resent my mom volunteering me to do all kinds of things. <laughs> but now I look back and say, I'm so thankful that she did that because now I know it's just what we do. It's just what we're supposed to do. But she <coughs> forced me to do it because she did it. Okay? So aging is a witness to us. Okay? Yes, that's true of people at all ages. All ages. Always setting an example in, in oh. some sense. Uh, and that's why who you have as your as your friends be so Absolutely. You're going to, to follow their example to some extent without even realizing or intending it. Absolutely. And that's one of the big issues I think with these days is that some of our young people forget that other people are watching them. Mm, yeah. And some of our older people forget that other people are watching them. And so you get these things that are posted and put up onto the internet that are teaching all kinds of not so good things mm -hmm. because we forget that everybody else is watching. And, you know, the, the internet, I think, should show us that we're being watched <laughs> because of all the pictures and things that are out there. But we laugh when it's somebody else's picture that's there, but when it's our own, we're mortified. But then it's just that cycle. So it, it's very. I think now, in particular, we have to be very, very careful to show the young people how to express ourselves, how to live our life, how to, how to live, how to cope, how to mourn, and how we can do that well in, in a proper way. So that's aging. But there are some special things for the young to do. While we're still able, we care for the aging. This is a picture of myself and my head staff from, from uh, camp uh, showing our, our strength <laughs> to do the work that we have to do. And sometimes, you know, caring for the aging, it might be that we're taking care of someone who is younger than us. But they're in a different stage of their aging process because it, it happens at different rates for everyone. My, my grandmother, uh, God bless her, she died uh, just a, a couple of years ago, but when she was in her, she was 90, 95 when she died, when she was in her late 70s, she was taking care of people who were younger than she was, who were old and, and couldn't do anything, so she would go and sit with them, she'd sleep at their house and make sure, you know, that the house didn't burn down while they were sleeping or something. Uh, but she did that because she knew that her job was to care for the aging. We can't just push these people away and say we're not going to take care of them. Again, the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And so we have a responsibility to those people who are aging. So for those of us who can, at every age, as Arthur just mentioned, we care for those who are, uh, who are aging. Okay? St. Paul tells Timothy, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Okay, so that's the people who are older there. All right? And he has another quote there. We can uh, go back around. Actually, Tona, would you want to read that next one? Since you're far away, you have to read loud. <laughs> the second bullet under care for the aging. Okay. If any widow has children or grandchildren... Let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. For this is good and acceptable before God. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow. So that's St. Paul really pushing the young there. If you, have, if you are a child or a grandchild, and especially if they're in your own house, you should be taking care of them, if that's at all possible. And so we, people are, uh, it's our calling then to do what we can to care for those people who, who are older and who, who cannot uh, care for themselves. Uh, I know the faithfulness of my own parents with my grandmother um, had Alzheimer's and lived with them for the last eight years or so. 
much, and it became harder and harder and harder. And, and my mom at one point said, you know, she had determined that, you know, my grandmother, because she really lost all, she couldn't remember who she was or anybody else was, and my mom warred with God and said, you know, why is she still here? Uh, what are you doing? And then she kind of got an answer that Grandma's still there for your salvation because you need to take care of her and you need to learn about self-sacrificing and, and things like that. And so she really, for the rest of my grandmother's life, kept that in her head that my mother-in-law is here because for my salvation. This is this is for me to learn, and, and so part of our. Uh, our responsibility as young people then is to learn about how we are to care for others through sacrifice, through self-sacrificial love, and that's, that's really a, that's an important thing. St. Paul says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so that's where we are called as Christians to bear each other's burdens. And sometimes, again, we might be caring for someone who's younger than us, but who are further along in the aging process than we are. So then it's our responsibility to help them do what we can. And I have Simon of Cyrene there. Why? Bear each other's burdens. Bear each other's burdens. What did Simon do? Bore the cross. Carried yeah. Christ's cross. He carried the cross. Even, and I, I am always struck by that. Even Christ couldn't carry his own cross. Physically. He needed help. And that's just amazing that, that God, the creator of the universe, couldn't walk up the hill to Golgotha on his own carrying that cross. Simon came and bore that part. And so we have we bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay? Uh, Megan, do you want to read that last quote under care for the aging? Again, you have to read loud since you're out there. But may you not be such, O young men, for not even for you is there the excuse for sinning. Why so? Because it is possible to be old in youth. Just as there are youths in old age, so also the reverse. For as in the one case the white hair saves no one, so in the other the black is no in impediment. Okay, St. So John Chrysostom. We're called to be wiser even in our young age be able to do the things that we that should be done for those who are aging and even learn the lessons of aging even while we're young. And it's better even to learn them while we're young so that we can bear bear up under the aging as, as we continue to move forward. And so it's it's very important for us who are able to take care of others and to, to care for us is something that we pray for all the time in in uh, Vespers, in Matins, in the Divine Liturgy. We pray for a Christian ending to our life. That's a good death. We want a Christian ending. That's, that's a good death. Painless, blameless, peaceful, and a good defense before the fearful judgment seat of Christ. That's the definition of a good death. So we pray for that every single service. We pray for that. So you can rest in the knowledge that every time you come to church, you are praying that that all of this suffering, all of the aging, the process that we go through, will end in a Christian ending to our life, painless, blameless, peaceful, and a good defense before the fearful judgment seat of Christ. That's what it's all about. And that's what a good death is. And I have here uh, Father John Breck uh, from his book, The Sacred Gift of Life. The only good death for the Orthodox Christian is the peaceful acceptance of the end of his or her earthly life with faith and trust in God and the promise of the resurrection. And really, the icon of the Dormition is the icon of a good death. It's not sudden. It's surrounded by our loved ones. The Mother of God was surrounded by the apostles, surrounded by other people that were there, uh, that wanted to be with her. Uh, and it was accompanied with prayer. They sang songs and sang hymns together. And they all were there as she passed. Yes. Is a martyr's death considered a good death? It is considered <laughs> a good death. I mean... It is, yes, absolutely. It's because reverence, but it seems very different than the picture you're painting. Right. This is the ideal we know for sure. This is what we all hope for. I mean, I hope for this death as opposed to a martyr's death. Mm. Um, because that's... Yeah, I changed my mind on that after I got to be about 18. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> However, we do look at this prayer 
and say that the most important parts of that prayer really are blameless and a good defense before the dread judgment seat of Christ because we can't always have painless. We can pray for it. It won't always be peaceful. We can pray for it, but we really, really want to hope that it is blameless, that we are are uh, working to be righteous before God and then therefore we will have a, a, a good defense before the dread judgment seat of Christ. So this picture of working towards a good death is working tr through the aging process, through our, our, our daily life of suffering and ending in um, ripe old age death. So th thank you for that. But that, that's, the, that's the image that we're hoping for and praying for, ideally. Uh, but really all of these things, though, can, if you're old and, or you're young and you're working with someone who's going through suffering or going, walking towards, uh, towards death, all of these things would apply, no matter the age. But those, of, those who have the uh, uh, great gift from God to be able to grow old and get to that, to that point, um, that, that's a great blessing, uh, to be able to work towards this death in particular. And the church, I think, likes to give us a picture of um, ideal, the ideal, the ideal perfection. But even in that definition of, of Father John Breck, the good death being acceptance of his or her earthly life, the, uh, the acceptance of the end of a person's earthly life. You but, can be facing the sword. is a martyr's death, too. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You can be facing the sword. Yeah. And you can peacefully say, great, I am going to die. This is wonderful. With full faith and trust in the resurrection. So absolutely. So that could be in a, in a violent moment like that as well. It is the most important. So we can end, just hit it one more time, with these last words uh, from uh, Father John Breck. Arthur, why don't you read that, that first quote there? The life freely bestowed by God must one day be freely and willingly surrendered to Him, in order that He remain Lord over both the living and the dead. Our task is to find ever more compassionate and pastorally sound ways to accompany the dying toward the final step that they alone can take, of surrendering their life and eternal destiny into God's open and loving hands. Okay, so ideally, this aging process has brought us to that point of being able to make that choice to let go, to let go of this life and to be able to journey towards the kingdom of God. And, and in fact, um, from what I understand, um, people often, um, well, when their loved ones tell them, it's okay, you can go, I'll be okay. That, that when they are surrounded by that love and that, that peace from people that are around them, that it's easier for them to let go. And this whole process of suffering and, and aging within the context of Christ and His Church allows us to get to that place and to have that hope in, in the resurrection. And so when we understand the process of what's going on, we can see how God has worked throughout our life to get us to that to that particular place. Um, I will talk about um, how the Church then begins to uh, help us at those last times to see and experience that, especially at those last moments of our life. And uh, based on Elizabeth's question from last week, I've actually shifted things a bit and I'm going to include a, a lot next time on how anybody can minister to a person who is in their, their last stages of life important things that the church tries to do that not only the clergy can do, but everybody can do. And hopefully that will equip you to be uh, more comfortable with helping someone to see all of these things that, that you've just learned because you can't just walk into a, a hospital room and say, hey, guess what? It's great you're suffering because uh, this isn't going to end in resurrection and it's going to be wonderful for you. Why are you so sad about this? This is great. If you were that Father Phillips talk, you should have been. Let me just tell you all about it. Uh, there are other ways that we do that. And so um, I'm, my hope is then to, to, to uh, allow you to, to see some of the things that the church does in preparation for death so that you can do them yourself. Uh, and then also know how the church then prays, how the church then prepares the person as they reach death, and then 
um, as they die and move towards the funeral service itself. Megan has been carrying around the book the last few weeks, a Christian ending. I know she's been waiting for me to get to it. And we'll start, <laughs> we'll start getting more into the things that are described there, some of the practical things as well, uh, as we move ahead next week. Uh, but that, that's the hope then. So we, we know all the theology now about death, about suffering, and about aging. And then we're going to turn a corner into some of the practical things that the church does so that it's not just information on the page, but it's actually concrete things uh, that we can and should do as our loved ones near the end of their life and, um, and we can help them to see this theology. Because the theology is meaningless if it's not practiced in a way that, that touches our life. And every single thing that I just... Yeah, I shall be